and you should. Again, this is a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching church. I want you to go with me to Nehemiah. As we begin our series on family portraits, family portraits, uh, favor in the family. Our theme for the year is favor, and for the month of uh, November, I'm sorry, this is not November. What is this? This is February. Thank you. It's my birthday month. Hallelujah. For the month of February. Hallelujah. For the month of February, we're going to be focusing on the family. Focusing on the family. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 11 through 14. You have it, say amen. amen. All right, three of you all have it. Greg is still actually looking for it. He just says amen because. Hallelujah. All right, if you have it, say amen. amen. All right. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 11. Also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bowls. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your families. I'm so upset that Anselm is not here. He would love this little portion and fight. <laughs> we would have to correct him and let him know, don't start a fight, <laughs> but fight, and fight for, uh, lost my place. and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. I want to read that 14th verse again. After I looked, old, looked things over, I stood and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Uh, the, the passage that I read to you this morning uh, from the book of Nehemiah is a uh, a picture of Nehemiah and the people that have returned from a bondage in, uh, uh, to the Babylonians rebuilding the wall, uh, setting the gates uh, back in their places so that uh, the Jews, the Jewish family that had returned uh, to Jerusalem would have a sense of safety uh, while they were living in Jerusalem. And those who disliked the Jews, those who did not want to see the walls rebuilt, that did not want to see the gates reset, uh, were threatening to uh, rush into the city and to fall upon the workers. This was a, a real threat from a, a very present enemy. Uh, they wanted to destroy the work and, and stop Jerusalem from uh, being rebuilt uh, so that the people would have a sense of safety and security, a real threat. And Nehemiah's response to that threat, I, I just love it. It says, uh, stand ready you, with your bow, with your arrow, and with your swords, with your spears, and be ready to fight for your families. Hallelujah. Uh, Some place in scripture where the, 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 the Lord tells us to fight. Hallelujah. Fight for your families. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for your wives and fight for your homes. Again, a real threat uh, from some people who intentionally wanted to do harm to those who were working on the building of the wall. A real threat and a real measured response from the, the, the person who was leading the rebuilding of the wall, Nehemiah. Fight. Fight. Everybody say fight. 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 Hallelujah. Fight. I remember it in the context here. Uh, I, I want to suggest to you this morning that the family is under attack. Yes. Let me say it again. I, I want to suggest to you this morning that the, the family is under attack. And just as Nehemiah gave word to those who 
were with him and were helping him in the re uh, responsibility of rebuilding the wall, uh, God says to us, as we're under attack, that we should fight for our families. Say amen, somebody. That we should fight for our sons. That we should fight for our daughters. That we should fight for our wives. And that we should fight for our homes. We are under an insidious attack from society at large, which has written the family off for the most part and, and, and is suggesting now that the traditional family unit is extinct and, and not necessary to the raising of children. Uh, they're suggesting all other types of ways that this can be done. Uh, our society is attempting to rename and, and, and redefine uh, what the family actually is. We are under an attack from society at large. Not only are we under attack from society at large, but I would suggest to you that we are under a direct attack from the enemy himself. The enemy hates God. The enemy hates Jesus, and he hates man that has been created in the image and the likeness of God. How can the enemy destroy man? He can destroy the basic unit of the family context. If he destroys the family, he can destroy men. So we are under attack, and this is not a new thing. This is something that has been happening since the inception of the family, since the family began, since the family had its genesis and its birth. The family has been under attack uh, from the enemy, <clears throat> been under attack from the enemy. Adam and Eve, they and their children constituted the first family. Did you know that? Adam and Eve and their children, their, their, their children uh, constituted the first family. And, and the scripture let us know that Cain rose up and slew his brother Abel. The family is under attack. Abraham and Sarah invited Hagar into their relationship into that, 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 that uh, family that they had established. They had invited a third party in, and the tension between Ishmael and Isaac is still rampant and still apparent today here in our society. Isaac and Rebekah had twins. Isaac loved her son Esau because he was a man of the field, a one who liked to hunt, a, a, a man's man. And, and it says that Rebecca loved Jacob, who was a herdsman and, and a homebody. Tension in the family. Jacob and Leah and Rachel and Zilpah and Bilhah, if that's not a picture of dysfunction, I don't know what is. Uh, Jacob had four wives. Two he didn't count as wives, but they were bearing his children. And, and they competed for the attention of their husband by having male children uh, so that they could have his attention. What a picture of dysfunction. Well, why uh, is all of this happening? Because the family is under attack. Samuel, not Samuel, Eli, the judge in the book of Samuel, had sons that were, uh, uh, as, as the people were coming to the, the tabernacle to make sacrifices for their sins, it says that, that Samuel, Eli's sons, were sleeping with those who were coming to make sacrifices. The family is under attack. Now David, the great king of Israel, had all types of familial strife within his family. His son Onan uh, fell in love with his sister, uh, took her and, and, and uh, had a, a sex with her and, and then was killed by his brother Absalom. Absalom, uh, the, the son of David, uh, attempted to take the throne from his father and, and attempted to draw the attention and the affection of the people of Israel onto himself, away from his father. Uh, uh, and, and, and David had to flee the city with his people. Well, why? Because the family is under attack. If the family is under attack, then we have a responsibility as leaders in our family to fight. Amen? Amen. 
If the family is under attack, if the family unit, which is the basic unit of any successful society, then we as a people have a responsibility to fight for our families. Fight that they stay intact. Fight that they, that they don't have things pushed on them that, that are not their own. Well, well, how do I fight for my family? I fight for my family when I realize that, that number one, I realize that, that the family system, as it is, the family itself is a creation of God. That's the first thing. We need to recognize that the family is instituted by God, that it's created by God, that it is of God's design. I should fight for my family because it is God's perfect design. If you flip over to the book of Genesis, flip over real quickly. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see God in his creative process. The first six days he created in anticipation of what he would create on the sixth day. On the sixth day he created man in his image and after his likeness. As we go into Genesis chapter 2, we see Adam. Adam is in the garden. And God gives Adam an assignment and brings before Adam all of the beasts of the field, all of the birds of the air, all of the cattle and all of the wild animals and he brings them before Adam and it says that whatever Adam named them, that's what they were called. And th this speaks to the brilliance of Adam at this particular time. Unfallen man was brilliant and, and, and was able uh, to converse with and, and be in, in constant interaction with God. This brilliant man named all of the animals of the field. The exercise of naming these animals, it, it, I believe, was, was, uh, 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 was, was to prepare Adam for what God was about to make for him. As Adam named the animals, I'm sure uh, that he began to recognize and realize that the animals all came in pairs. I'm sure he began to wonder, well, everyone has a pair. There's two types. There's two elephants. There's two cows, male and female. There's two jaguars. There's two doves. They, when they're coming to present themselves before Adam to be named by Adam, they're, they're coming in pairs. And I'm sure that Adam began to recognize and began to think in that, that intelligent mind that was given him at the creation, where is my other half? Where is my pair? Where is that part that will make me complete? And so Adam recognizes, God recognizes, Adam recognizes the need for completion. The need for completion. And the scripture says, again in Genesis, and I, I'm, I'm way up here so I'm not looking at the scripture. Uh, but in, in Genesis chapter 2 it says that God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. It's interesting to note that in this context... That God didn't tell Adam what he was about to do. He just put him to sleep. <laughs> Knocked him out. He didn't consult with Adam to find out from Adam what would you like. He, he just knocked Adam out. And it says that as Adam was sleeping, he took a rib from Adam. And from that rib, he fashioned a woman. God created family when he created Eve. You see, we are made in the image and the likeness of God, and God is a social being. God is social. A Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are constantly interacting with each other, and being made in His image and in His likeness, we have a need to be social with one another. So He takes this rib from Adam, and from that rib He fashions a woman. And then I love what it says. It says, and he brought her unto the man. Well, if that's not marriage, I don't know what is. I remember when my daughter got married. Where were we at? That place? Beautiful place. A little pond or lake in the backdrop. 
It was just gorgeous. But I can remember walking my daughter down the aisle. I brought my daughter and I presented her to that man. <laughs> oh, he's a good guy. He, he's a wonderful guy. I'm just messing with him. But, but I, I, I walked her down the aisle. Uh, she was my creation. My, my wife and I's creation. She doesn't look like me. She looks like my wife. But I had something to do with that. And, and, and I marched down the aisle with her and I presented her to Stephen. That's the establishment of the family. That's the establishment of that. So God not only created man in his image and in his likeness, uh, but to fulfill the social component that is so necessary in man, it says that God brought the woman to the man. And you know what the man said? Wow. So this is now bone of my bone. And flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He got excited. I remember when I first saw my wife. For well, the first time she said, oh. <laughs> oh, you said it before. <laughs> I knew somebody over there said it. <laughs> I was in North Central University. I'm, <laughs> And I was standing out in front of the chapel, waiting to go in because we had chapel on a daily basis. And across the street, this woman was walking. And you know what I said? Wow. I didn't say this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, but that's what I was thinking. And even though I didn't know her name, had never seen her before on campus. I determined right then, I'm going to marry that woman. <laughs> Just by looking, she was, she was fine. That's what it is. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Stand up, baby. Look at that. <laughs> uh, that's reality. I, I did not follow in love with my wife's, uh, uh, I was not first attracted to my wife's intellect. She's very intelligent. As Dr. Edna, yes. I didn't fall in love with her spirituality because I didn't know if she was spiritual or not at that particular time. What, what first attracted me to my wife was how she looked. And all of that other stuff came afterwards. But it was the way she looked that caused me to pursue her initially. And then I fell in love with her intellect. I fell in love with her spirituality. And I thank God that God put a package together for me. Amen. That I can do. All right. I just, I just made a big deposit <laughs> in the love bank. Did I do all right, baby? <laughs> Think I'll make a withdrawal <laughs> sometime in the future. Hallelujah. <laughs> so he brings her to Adam, and Adam says, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. And then Adam, not God, but Adam ex expounds on God's intention. Th this is really important for us to see. God does not expound on his intention, but Adam expounds on what God's intention was by bringing this pairing to him. He expounds on it. Uh, the, the marriage principle stated here is based upon the di dynamic of sameness and difference. You know, we're human beings, but men and women are as different as night and day. Say amen, man. Amen. Oh, All right, you say it too. <laughs> this passage forms for us the biblical understanding of marriage and the family. Uh, this is our, our bedrock. This is when we defend the, the, the family unit, we defend it on this 
principle, the institution of monogamous uh, marriage, home and family, is the basic medium for the propagation of the red, a race and the passing on of the faith to the next generation. The family unit. This is God's original family. This is God's original ideal family. He always meant for us to be in a familial situation. This isn't polygamy. This isn't uh, uh, keeping a mistress. This isn't adultery. This isn't homosexual cohabitation. Uh, this isn't promiscuity. This isn't living together outside of the bonds of marriage. This is God's ideal of the family. Say amen. amen. And even when we, when we don't live up to it, it is still important to set forth this as God's ideal. Say amen. amen. Somebody, this is God's ideal. God's ideal. And then listen to what Adam says. He brings this beautiful creature to him to complete him, to establish the beginning of the family unit. And listen to the profound statement that Adam makes. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother. What would make you leave home? Yeah, I love being at home. All my needs were taken care of. Mama cooked every day. Dinner was on the table at 5.30, so my dad could eat before he went to work at 6.30. I, I, the home was great. You know, I didn't have to buy a detergent. I didn't have to buy food. All I had to do was keep a little gas in my car. Everything else was provided. But, but Adam says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall what? Cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Uh, why will a man leave the comforts of home? Because he found his other half. And now it's his turn to establish a family which is under attack by the enemy. The family system has many different expressions. The ideal is the nuclear family, the man, his wife, and their children, but there are many different expressions of the family around the world and, and here, even in the United States, that we see. You know, some families are led by single parents. You know, uh, they've been destroyed by divorce or by death. Uh, some families are, are, are extended families where it's, it's not just mom and dad, but it's mom and dad and grandma and grandpa. And, and, and siblings that are living together. But the family unit uh, is the basic unit of any successful society. It's no wonder that the enemy is attacking the family. You destroy the family, you destroy society. So, let, let's talk about how the enemy is attacking the family today. If the family is under attack, what methodologies are the enemy using to attack the family? I'm going to give you five things that the enemy is using. I wish uh, these were up on the screen, but <clears throat> we'll, we'll, they'll be there next week. The first one is the messed up marriage. Say that with me, the messed up marriage. <laughs> well, what is the messed up marriage? The messed up marriage is, in short, the marriage where the priorities of the marriage center on everything but the most important things. The priorities of the marriage uh, are, are um, of the marriage center on everything but the most important thing. A good marital relationship emphasizes the bonding of the mother and the father and the loving of the children and the passing on of the faith to the next generation. That's really what it's all about. But in, in, in the messed up marriage, other things become the priority. You know, we've all probably all seen marriages where one person becomes the priority in the marriage. 
Uh, it's not two people pulling the weight together, but it's one individual that is uh, 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 monopolizing all of the time and the commitment and, and, and the focus is, is on that one person. Or, or maybe it's a job or, or work or advancement uh, that becomes the, the, the priority in that relationship. And the family goes untended because money is, is driving uh, that family. Or maybe it's hobbies. You know, all of us probably know somebody who has all of the latest gadgets. A snowmobile, a four-wheeler, a pair of skis, jet skis. Uh, what is, is that jet ski? That, yeah, jet ski. Uh, all types of stuff. <laughs> or education. Or any number of things I sneak in and become the priority when the relationship between the husband and the wife and the relationship between the parents and the children should be the number one priority in our families. The messed up marriage. Second, greatest threat to the family is outsourcing. Say outsourcing. outsourcing. There's an old saying, if it's worth doing, it's worth delegating. And that's true in the business world, where a CEO should not be responsible for uh, the daily management of a company. And, and it's true that, that, that uh, minor tasks should be delegated to those who are capable and can do it. But it's not true in the family, in the context of the family. Uh, it, 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 when it comes to teaching and leading our children, we can't outsource that. And we live in a time where people are outsourcing that all the time. We've gotten so frantic in our attempt to chase after the American dream of a house in the suburbs, a three-car garage, all of the gadgets, that both mother and father are working so hard to accomplish the dream that they really have no time for themselves and for their children. So we outsource them. We get babysitters for them. We put them in daycare. We send them to this camp. And to that game. And now don't misunderstand me. Some of these things can be good when, uh, good when they're done in moderation. But when those things become the main thing for the raising of our children in place of us, then they become something that we don't need to do. Outsource parenting responsibilities may seem efficient and effective, but when it comes to building a child's faith or character, outsourcing is a huge we can't expect for the school or the church or coaches or scout leaders or therapists or instructors to do the job that we need to do. They may be good resources, but they are not the source. They are not the primary teachers of our kids. We are. Say amen, somebody. Amen. I'm so thankful that when we were, when we had our children and when we were young, well, we're still young, sir. <laughs> 60 is the new, is it 40 or 30? Which one? Well, I'm 35, so 60 is the new 35. <laughs> uh, when we had uh, Tiffany and little Daryl, I'm so thankful that my wife didn't work. She stayed at home, and it was intentional on our part because we knew that those early years were the most critical for building in them a foundation that would carry them for the rest of their lives. So until our children got to school age, my wife didn't work. But once they got in school, boy, she couldn't wait to get a job. <laughs> Uh, it was work. She couldn't wait to get work to get away from the work that she had been doing. I, I'm so like, but, but, but now in many cases, parents are dropping their children off 
to a daycare, or to an activity. And because many of us don't live in close proximity to family, we're dropping them off to people we don't know. And people we can't trust. Uh, a classic example of this is this guy uh, from the gymnastics, this Nasser guy, you know, who is, is supposedly has molested uh, over 200 girls during the time that he was the, the, the doctor for uh, the, the girls' gymnastic team. 200. And, and these parents probably thought they were putting their children in good hands. And I'm not here to put fear in our hearts. I'm not here to stir up anything, but, but I am here to remind us that the primary responsibility for passing the faith on to the next generation is ours. Amen. Say amen. amen. That's why we adopted faith at home. That's why Stephen is not the kids pastor. He's the family life pastor. Because we want to do everything that we can to equip our families to pass the faith on to the next generation. Say amen. 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 Somebody outsourcing. Outsourcing. You know, there's no clock up there, so I don't know how long I'm preaching. <laughs> Third threat to the family. Screens. Everybody say screens. Screens. I want everybody to hold this screen up. All y'all got screens. Uh, <laughs> right. Got, got different sizes. Yeah. Oh, just, everybody, if you got a screen, turn it on and hold it up. I, I want to see it. If you got a screen. Yeah, look at that. Look at it. Yeah, everybody turn around and look. Turn around and look. <laughs> look, look at all the screen. <laughs> the TV screen. The computer screen, the iPad, the iPod, the iPhone. Am I, am I thinking, am I missing any other screen? Android. Android. Who uses an Android? We want to have special prayer for you all at the end of the service. Come on over to Apple. <laughs> the Android. <laughs> we'll give y'all special mention. The Android that doesn't work as good as the iPhone. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that our screens are captivating the attentions of society. So much so that if we let our children have free reign of those things, they would literally do nothing else. You set them down with the screen, and you can walk out the room and go do something else because they're on the screen. Focus. On the screen. Screens have become our new babysitters. And unfortunately, it's through those screens many times that improper behavior and highly sexualized content is finding its way to our children. So, so we need to make sure that if you give them a screen, and again, everything is okay if it's done and managed properly, we've got to manage it. We got to take it from them every once in a while and look at the content that they're exploring. We have to put the type of software on there that will block them from getting to certain places. So, so screens have become uh, something, uh, they, they become crack for our children. We're just on the screen. On the screen. So a little screen can really be a big threat. Say amen. amen. Fourth thing, competitors. So we've, we've looked at three things so far. We've looked at uh, messed up marriages. We've, we've looked at outsourcing. Uh, we've looked at screens. Th then competitors. Now, the, the competitors kind of ties in with the screens and, 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 and with the outsourcing. Uh, and, and it's, it's, it's uh, uh, driving to, to, to have a greater market share of our children's lives. 
Whatever that might be. It's, it's trying to steal time that we should be spending with our children uh, 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 and, and focusing their attention on something else. Sports, classes, activities, events, and things uh, can compete for your family's time, especially uh, if, if added in excess. And then fifthly, silence. Silence. So we talked about messed up marriages, talked about outsourcing, we talked about screens, we talked about competitors, and lastly we're going to talk about silence. <clears throat> A communication is the bedrock of any successful family. And messed up marriages, outsourcing, screens, and things that compete for the attention of our time in the family cause us not to communicate. Cause us not to communicate. A family without communication is nothing more than a bunch of roommates. And this threat is most dangerous because it can cause all the other issues on this list and vice versa. Silence is not golden when it comes to the family. If they're not talking to you, who are they talking to? And one of the things that I've heard over and over again is that we're too busy. You know, I, I, I thank God for my mother and my father. You know, we, every day, my mom cooked dinner. She made breakfast too. But every evening, my mother made dinner. And we all sat down at the dining room table together. There was no TV in the, in the dining room. There was nothing to distract us. If the phone rang, she said, don't answer. And we had those dial phones. You show a kid a dial phone. What's that? <laughs> we had family time together. Now, we didn't always talk a whole lot. You know. But we were together. It's hard to get the family together now. We're ripping and running. We're going hither, thither, and beyond. We are doing everything but spending time together as a family. And you know, this is not only true for families with children, but it's also true for just parents. We're so busy, we don't talk to each other. Our schedules are so awkward that we don't spend time with each other. It simply comes down to priorities, and if being too busy means you can't keep your marriage strong, if being too busy means you can't lead and strengthen your children, if being too busy means you can't limit yours and your kid's time on the screen, if being too busy means you can't reduce the number of extracurricular activities and communicate with, it, with each other regularly, then perhaps you need to consider being, well, not so busy. Not so busy. So, so those are the five top things that are threatening the family today. Messed up marriages, outsourcing, screens, competitors, and silence, the lack of communication. So what's our response? What's our response? Well, let me take you back to uh, our text in Nehemiah chapter 4. Our response is to fight for our family. Fight for our sons, for our daughters, for our wives, and for our homes. We need to fight. Well, how do we fight? How do we fight? How do we fight? Let me give you 11 things that we can do to fight for our families. 11 things. Number one, and, and maybe I'll print these, type these up and have them uh, in the bulletin or on a separate sheet for next week. Uh, spend time together as a family regularly, preferably weekly. <laughs> spend time together. Number two, spend time alone with your spouse on a daily basis. 
Spend time alone with your spouse on a daily basis. Number three, when your children need your attention, give it to them. Put away your electronics and all of your other distractions. Sink to their level and listen. Number four, accept that your family will not be perfect and don't beat yourself up when you make mistakes. Number five, keep yourself and your family members in good health so you have the energy to spend time together. Number six, don't give in to your children. <laughs> Amen? Make them work for things that they want and desire. Make them work. Hallelujah. Number seven, allow and create much laughter in the home. Number eight, keep an orderly home. Contention seems to decrease when the environment isn't in commotion. Number nine, travel together. And when you travel, take the screens. The screens. Take the screens. <clears throat> Number two, accept one another's differences and praise one another's accomplishments. Then finally, number nine, never speak unkindly behind anyone's back. Uh, we're in a fight for our families. Amen? Amen. I, I just want to close in prayer this morning, but what I want you all to do is I want you to get in your family unit. And we're going to close in prayer that way this morning with our families. If you don't have a family unit, find someone that you feel close to. Well, that's a part of your extended family. And get with them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everybody, everybody needs to get in a family unit right now. Now, you guys aren't leaving, are you? You guys are going to your family units? All right. Sometimes they're even coming from within. Father, today we want to lift up the families of Christ Church International. Father, we pray that you would strengthen our families with might by your spirit in the inner person. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would help us to prioritize our families, our relationships, between husbands and wives, between parents and children, 
above everything else. Father, we repent if we have allowed other things to come in and pull us away from that which is most important. Father, help us to find time to spend together on a daily basis when possible. Father, we ask it in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Oh. Pray. <laughs> <laughs> but Lord, we agree in the prayer that has already been prayed. And we thank you for the word that was given earlier today that if there was any um, enmity between us and our family members, Lord, that you would deal with our hearts, oh God, that we would be able to spend time yes. with each other. Yes. If there is resentment or bitterness or misunderstanding, well, we ask that you would clear the path so that we would be able to talk about those things and be able to move through it. We ask that you would grant them wisdom. Yes. And that the love of Christ will flow through them. Yes, Jesus. Father, that even when they feel that they can't love themselves, that they will allow your spirit to love through them. Yes. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Father, and we thank you that every assignment of the enemy is canceled. Yes. Jesus. Lord God, every fiery dart, Lord God, every arrow, Lord God, that he is prepared. Lord God, to destroy uh, our families, to unsettle our families, yes. to shake our families. Yes. Uh, Father, we set a hedge of protection yes. around about them, Lord God. We cancel the assignments of the enemy in the name of Jesus. Yes. Uh, open our eyes, yes, Lord God, that we may see, uh, Lord God, and help us, Lord God, to take the necessary responses, Lord God, to the things that we see being formed against us. Yes, Father, you said within your word that no weapon formed against us will prosper. Yes, Jesus. And every tongue that should rise up against us in judgment, you have condemned. You said, this is the heritage of the people of God. And Father, we claim that right now in the name of Jesus. Yes. Lord, we prioritize our families. We prioritize our relationships. Lord God, from this day forward, we put, Lord God, the emphasis back where it should be. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise.